Welcome uh, attendees to Bio 2022 to the last panel of the whole session, which is on celebrity biography. I'm Kate Buford. Um, I was co-chair with Ann Heller of the program committee and have been a member of Bio since the very beginning um, and have written a couple of celebrity bios myself, Burt Lancaster and the Native American athlete, Jim Thorpe. But I would like to introduce our panel today before we get started. And we will leave some time at the end uh, as all the panels have, I hope, uh, about 10 minutes to answer questions that you can post on the chat window. Uh, Kitty Kelly is an internationally acclaimed writer, has written seven biographies, all number one New York Times bestsellers. Her subjects have included Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, Elizabeth Taylor, Frank Sinatra, Nancy Reagan, the British Royal Family, the Bush Family, and Oprah Winfrey. Kelly has been honored with several awards, including the American Society of Journalists and Authors for Outstanding Author Award for her courageous, this is a quote, courageous writing on popular culture. Focus on courageous. <laughs> um, Stephen C. Smith is our second panelist, is, has been Emmy nominated four times as a documentary producer, author, and speaker who specializes in Hollywood history and profiles of contemporary filmmakers. He is the author of two acclaimed biographies, Music by Max Steiner, The Epic Life of Hollywood's Most Influential Composer, a finalist for Bio's 2020 Plutarch Award, by the way, and A Heart at Fire Center, The Life and Music of Bernard Herrmann. He is also a 16-time Telly Award winner. Stephen has produced and written over 200 documentaries about such subjects as Julie Andrews, Martin Scorsese, uh, Stephen Sondheim, uh, and many others. He can fill us in later. And he also does um, a series, fair to call them webinars, I think recently, on the fascinating subject of sin and censorship in pre-code Hollywood. And our third and last, but no means last panelist, Alan Rohde, produces and hosts cinema events while producing classic film commentaries and documentaries himself. And he works with Stephen quite a lot. His biography, Michael Curtiz, A Life in Film, recently published in paperback, received rave reviews from the New York Review of Books, among other outlets. He is the producer and host, where he is right now, of the annual Arthur Lyons Film Noir Festival in Palm Springs. And I've been there, and so is Stephen, and we can attest that it is a wonderful event. Alan is also charter director of the Film Noir Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to restoring lost films from the classic film noir era. So I thought I would start by reading a brief paragraph from a book that was recommended to me when I was writing about famous people called The Frenzy of Renown by Leo Browdy. It was published by Oxford in 1986. Um, and I think this sort of sets up what we'd like to talk about among other things. Fame is, and I'm quoting now, fame is made up of four elements, a person and an accomplishment their immediate publicity, and what posterity has thought about them since. Since people are vehicles of cultural memory and cohesion, they allow us to identify what's present with what's past. By preserving their names, we create a self-conscious grammar of feeling and action that allows us to connect where we have been as a society and where we are going. How they and their supporters, and that includes biographers, ensured that they would be remembered is therefore a crucial part of the story of their fame. The audience must be lured into remembering them. So I think I would like to start out with defining celebrity. And I know Kitty has some strong feelings on this. Um, talk about the, the, the key word of this panel, which is what is celebrity? And is it any different from fame? Thank you, Kate. I do have very strong feelings. Um, I cannot abide the term celebrity biographer. I abhor it, and I'll tell you why. I think it diminishes the, the writing of a life story. Biographers have to fight for their, for their room on the shelf next to historians who look down on us as biographers. And within biography, to be defined as a celebrity biography is a biographer is almost like being defined as a blonde 
writer. <laughs> it gets in the way of what you do and the story you're trying to tell. So while I'm very, very happy to be on this panel, I object to celebrity as a definition of the biographies we write. Now, having said that, um, no, you go ahead, Kate. No, you go ahead, Kitty. <laughs> Finish it. <laughs> now that is, well, actually, that leads to another question. How do you evaluate, all of us, any of us, how do you evaluate what someone is famous for? Particularly in this era we live in where people are famous for being famous. So what do they do? What I think I think fame is based on accomplishments, and I think uh, a lot of fame has a timeline. Where certainly the person I wrote about, Michael Curtiz, who directed Yankee Doodle Dandy, Casablanca, White Christmas, and all of that, his fame had really eclipsed where his work was known and and treasured and passed on to generations, but the. Uh, the, the man who made these movies had been completely forgotten or was the subject of a punchline on an antidote. But I also kind of lean towards Kitty, the term celebrity. When I hear celebrity, I think of Paris Hilton or the Kardashians. I, I, I don't celebrity. We now we're in an era now where people are famous for being famous and not for necessarily accomplishing anything. And I think Fame is tied to accomplishments, uh, whether in the present tense or the present mind or the past mind. And celebrity is kind of this uh, um, uh, ephemeral type of, of uh, transitory type mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. Couldn't that's, agree more. That's a very good distinction. <laughs> what did you say, Kitty? <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And as a matter of fact, you have to promise me that when I go to the angels and the tombstone says, here lies celebrity biographer, Kitty <laughs> Kelly. You'll come along with your cement stick and cross off celebrity. <laughs> and please just let me go to the angels as a biographer. Thank you. So may here, we all. Here. Um, here, here. Following on that, how would each or any of you say writing about famous people, people of fame who have accomplished something in their lives, is different from any other biography subjects. I mean, anyone is written about because they've done something that someone thinks. Steve Stevens nodding his head. What are what are the differences? Uh, for me, one of them is the fact that unlike many biography subjects, you are already encountering multiple biographies of their lives, narratives that they or their publicists or others have told, or well-meaning journalists who got the facts wrong, and then that's repeated. So when e even dealing with someone like Max Steiner, a, a, a very well-known person within his field, he scored Gone with the Wind, Casablanca, King Kong, he, he essentially created the film score as we know it in the sound era, uh, he had multiple stories of his life being told. And it was, of course, a, a great adventure as it is for all biographers to try to go back to all the primary sources, to put all of that uh, narrative that you're that's easily found aside. And in the case of Steiner, most of it was wrong. And it was the pleasure of not only reintroducing someone to, to the culture again, as Alan did with his wonderful Curtiz book, mm -hmm. but it was telling a story that had not been told at all. I mean, it, it, and it was a remarkable story, almost like a, a European version of E.L. Doctorow's Ragtime with its celebrities and mm. its forgive me using that word, and Emperor Franz Joseph knowing the Steiner family who were like the Ziegfelds of Austria and cameos by everyone from, you know, J. Edgar Hoover to Joseph Stalin to Gustav Mahler to Elvis Presley. So uh, that that's how it's different, I think, though, is that you're, you're having to weed your way through what people think is the story and what you may think is the story. Mm -hmm. The truth is very different. That's, that's a, I think that's exactly right. Yeah, it's exactly right. And I think, too, it's very important to rediscover some of these people who have been ignored or underestimated. Burt Lancaster was one, I say, because I wrote about him. No one had connected the dots and it was a remarkable career, an important career. So you're not only writing about someone who did something, but as um, Alan said, people have forgotten about what that person did and it's important. So you're, you're resurrecting a life in many ways and finding the importance. Um, Stephen, you, you wrote 
one of the really wonderful things about the two books that you wrote about music, Hollywood musical composers was, and this gets to what makes someone famous. Why are you writing a book about them? You really deconstructed the music itself for a general audience like myself who would not necessarily understand those intricacies. Um, Alan did the same thing with Curtis directing, um, but music's even more a little esoteric. How did you approach that and know that you were explaining this to someone like myself who doesn't really understand music beyond the basics? Well, that is the most challenging thing, writing about a composer. I, I had a bit of an advantage in that both of the composers I wrote books about, Bernard Herrmann and Max Steiner, worked primarily or are at least best known for their film work. So when you're talking about Casablanca or King Kong, at least you're, you're, you're dealing with, with memory and people will know the films. But uh, music, the language of music is very intricate and you can very quickly be writing over a general reader's heads. That was the last thing I wanted to do. I wanted to write a book that was for the general public that wouldn't offend musicians when they, when they read it. And I turned in both instances to the person who I think did it better than anyone, Leonard Bernstein. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, records, we have video of his young people's mm. young people concert guides, which of course were not really just for young people, they were for a general audience. He did these wonderful televised lectures, the series Omnibus, the same thing. And so, it, I, I would say that so many biographies have involve a specialized language. If it's a scientist, of course, there are scientific terms you need to explain to someone. Math, mm -hmm. if it's if it's uh, nautical, you know, there are those terms. So what I tried to do is write very very clearly and introduce words like glissandos, arpeggios, chromatics, and chromaticism, and and just not people feel that they had to memorize these things, but but get familiar with them and then write in a way that, that honed in on the emotional effect that was being created and mention also the instruments that were being played. So uh, it, I, I hope I succeeded and uh, I, I had my, I, there was in the earlier panel today the discussion of who reads your book before you give it to the editor. In my case, <laughs> it was a, a general reader who is an excellent writer, uh, a professional musician, and my brother, because I'm writing for myself. We all write for ourselves a little bit, and so he's, he's uh, my audience, if you will. And I took the musician's notes, and, and I took the notes from my friend who said, I'm confused about this term, and, and uh, looked for similes. So it, it is a bit of a, a, a unique process, but again, not too dissimilar from everyone who has to write about a, a world that we just don't know. But of course, best case scenario, you invite people into that, and I've had, mm -hmm. I'm happy to say, a positive response to of, of people saying that they understood it. Mm -hmm. How about you, Alan, with writing about Curtis, who I believe at one point maybe still had the record of the most, the director who'd done the most movies for Warner Brothers, maybe anybody. Oh yeah, he, he certainly directed the most movies for Warner Brothers. And, and one, of the, one of the labor intensive aspects was figuring out how many movies he actually directed whole or in part and then uh, putting a filmography in the back of the book mm -hmm. and the book kept, you know, it was like the gift that kept on giving or the line from Chinatown when John Huston says to Jack Nicholson, you may think you know what you're dealing with, but believe me, you don't because it went on for six years. But in Curtiz's case, um, I, ha I had to basically deconstruct so much that had been written about him that I discovered to be erroneous or just false. Like he was a vocational mechanic of the studio system who was given a script and he shot the movie and paint by the numbers. And a lot of this came uh, due to the timing of his death in 1962. And this was when people like Peter Bogdanovich and Andrew Saris and Richard Schickel really started writing about golden age directors like Raoul Walsh and Bill Wellman. And these people were still around and Curtiz wasn't. And this was when the auteur theory took hold where the directors had a specific signature. And in some cases, uh, people who were interviewed extensively like Howard Hawks claimed responsibility for everything positive attribute of their movies, which, which are, some of the recollections were kind of fabulous. So there was all of that. And what was invaluable was the Warner Archive collection at mm. USC, 
-hmm. where all the paperwork of every film, uh, probably roughly from the early 30s into the 50s had been preserved. So you can go through all the memos between the producers and Curtiz and so forth. And of course, what I discovered was Curtiz would agree with Hal Wallace or Daryl Zanuck, who wanted to make the movie in their way. And then he would go down to the set and do whatever he wanted to. He would change wardrobe, he would rewrite scenes. And so there was this constant tug of war between movies that Curtiz thought were his, but it was really theirs, Jack Warner and Hal Wallace and so forth. And there was this constant. And then as things changed, he got more power. And then all of these antidotes that as Steve made reference to the studio publicity mill or the Hollywood reporter or variety, because there's so many things in the trade papers that when somebody at the publicity department at Warner Brothers or somebody's agent was, was having a, a, a slow day, they just make something up. Like we're gonna put Ronald Reagan as Rick in Casablanca or George Raft. And I found out so many of these things simply weren't true and that Curtiz really was a totally artist, artistic man who was, who was really an artist who arranged every setup and so forth. So a lot of what I did was kind of with, with a pair of shears going through this jungle of press releases and anecdotes that had been reprinted so many times that they kind of hardened into this bedrock of Hollywood folklore mm -hmm. that became accepted as truth and cutting through all of that. So that was... You know, that was really my experience of Curtiz, of telling a story about a man and his life and his work that really hadn't been told before mm -hmm. accurately. Well, now, Kitty, you have a different challenge because you have written about people who are really household names, very famous. We don't have to uh, wonder who they were, who they, yeah, in most cases were. Tell us a little bit about, and I won't use celebrity, famous people, distinguished people, political people, royal people. <laughs> And you're writing about them and everyone knows who they are or they think they know who they are. How is that a different challenge? Uh, one thing I want to say that I think will be helpful. I hope it's helpful to everybody, no matter who you're writing about. Movie star, president, first lady. Take the time to sit down and write a chronology beginning with the year of birth to the year of death. I'm not asking you to follow it that way when you write, but do make a chronology. This will become the key to your work and take it with you when you do interviews. This chronology should be benign. Do not put judgment in it. Put date of birth and facts. And when you start writing this, it'll start out five pages, it'll become 10 pages. And by the time you're ready to interview someone, it should be about 45 to 85 pages. You take this chronology with you. And when you go in, someone will say, oh, I've known Frank Sinatra for, I've known him forever, really. How did you first meet him? Oh, and then they'll say this or that. And you'll go back to your, you'll show them the chronology and this will help you do the interview. It'll place the information where it should be placed. And it'll also help the person you're interviewing because that person will look at your chronology and say, oh my God, I remember, yeah, on Anchors of What, oh, that's right. That was when he was having the affair with my aunt Susie. And you <laughs> try never to react. Really? How does Aunt Susie get in there? This chronology will help you so much. The second thing I would say to biographers, after every single interview you do, write a thank you. Write an email. Say, dear Kate, I love talking to you today. It was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. I didn't get a chance, though, to tell you how pretty those pearl earrings were that you wore. And I always wondered about what the hangers were doing in the back of the blah, blah, blah. Something to locate, because four years from now, that person might not want to be thanked. That person might deny speaking to you. It happened to me when I did the Nancy Reagan book, 
the Reverend Don Muma denied giving me an interview. I had to make sure that he saw the 45 minute tape transcript of the interview before he said that. As Winston Churchill says though, said, a lie will go halfway around the world before the truth can get its pants on. So you have to protect yourself and protect your publisher. So those, those are the two commandments I would give someone. Those now, are my question, Kate. <laughs> no, I, that's um, particularly, it's applicable to any biography project. But that's when you're dealing with, with famous people, people that are extremely well known, then it's even more important because they're going to be perhaps more defensive. I don't know. Um, but the, the kind of people you have treated, you have to approach them in a different way. Also, they were still alive. That's another issue for famous people. Is your subject dead, safely dead, or is your subject alive? And there's, all, there's that whole sort of mantra, cliche, kill the widow, you know, meaning that if you, you know, Stephen's laugh, you've heard that. I heard that with Lancaster. Um, if you're writing about, in this case, a man, who is dead, who has been famous, and the widow is still alive, you have to earn the trust of that person as you have to earn the trust of everyone. Um, that's one of the most important things. But I'm thinking, Kitty, just to pursue this a little bit longer, um, what we all know that, you, that your subjects were very um, famous, case of Sinatra, um, controversial. What about dealing with people who are alive? What about the approach? Did you have, did you build your, your, your interview list up to the top? Did you get the strategic part that was easy at the bottom, the low hanging fruit, and then work your way up? How did you, how did you handle that? I didn't have a specific way of doing it, but I will tell you there were times when I was doing the book on Sinatra at one point, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to interview a woman who um, uh, had claimed that she had had a relationship with Sinatra um, and that he had suggested, Kate, will you let me come back to this just a minute? I am having a bit of a problem, electrical sure. problem right here. Oh, okay, <laughs> go ahead. Oh. Dying to hear the Sinatra story. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Please go ahead. I'll be right oh, with you. Oh, okay. I've uh, got a little fire yeah, here. I, I think, Kate, the, the point about uh, being alive, uh, the people that Steve and I have written about were both deceased. But what I discovered was all of the family that is left over. And in Michael Curtiz's case, um, four children out of wedlock by four different women mm -hmm. and then the multiplicity of grandchildren and kind of navigating that minefield because there was a lot of um, sensitivity of issues and neglect and all of that and uh, doing these interviews and, and getting at the truth always and writing the truth, but also being respectful so you're 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 building bridges with your interviewees not burning them as you're assembling them very well put very yeah. well put yeah. um yeah I, that's a very good point i think we'd all agree biographers whether famous or not the subjects but even more with the famous ones because more people have skin in the game. you know they, they want their name in the book or they have their story they want to trot out and you have to it's a you build a network which is like a de facto family, you're both brilliant at it, where you cultivate in the best possible way, the trust of these people to get at the truth about your subject, um, yeah. dead or alive. Yeah. yeah. Um, we talked when we all spoke last week, we talked about public versus private life. <laughs> and the public life is all out there. Maybe it's not true, but it's, it's been recorded one way or another. But the private life is very different. Um, and getting to that private life, and of course, getting inside someone's head, which we can't do. I mean, we know the limitations of our 
craft, you cannot know the inside of someone's head. And um, so can we talk a little bit about that? Getting to the private life of a person. Kate, you did such a great job with Burt Lancaster in your book. And one of the things that I really uh, appreciate on how you dissected accurately was the so-called relationship or friendship between Burt Lancaster and Kirk Douglas, because <laughs> there is a very public perception of that that really was foisted by Kirk. And mm-hmm. then there was the reality. And, uh, you know, you might want to talk about that a little bit, because I found that very interesting. Well, that thank you. I mean, that does speak to a larger point about writing. I don't want to say celebrity. Yeah. Or, <laughs> um, that was because I had the cooperation of Bert's widow, Susie Lancaster. And she was the one who, right, you know, yeah. a witness. And, and particularly after Bert had a stroke five years before he died. And she did not let Kirk come visit him because Bert didn't want to see Kirk. He only wanted to see really close friends like George Burns and Sidney Poitier and Tony Curtis and people like that, that are very, very close friends. And um, yeah, that was because a very good relationship was established early on with a key person to get inside the head. But even a wife can't get inside the head of a husband or vice versa. But in terms of that relationship, yes, that if you're going to, and, and well, Kirk Douglas read the book twice and he sent me a seven page letter. <laughs> I should have done differently, you know? But, um, yeah. He, he, and well, that's a personal story. He clung and you'll find this too. A person clings to a, a myth because they want to believe it. And Kirk clung to that because he wanted to believe that Bert was a great friend. But I think, I think he, in the end, when you cling to that long enough and you live long enough, you do believe that. I think, right. I think he I legitimately believed that. At least he did when I talked to him in 2010. Yeah. Because he brought Bert up and he, he got a very wistful and emotional and mm-hmm. said how close they were and how much he missed him. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I well, think he believed that. Yeah, that's very well put. I think this gets to a, a big issue. Um, how do we find, that's a very human thing of, of Kirk. I mean, you could, it makes him more humane that even though he was wrong, he wanted to believe yeah, it. You know? So course. how do we get to the human being behind the famous person? Um, we have, we've talked about this before. I feel as biographers, we have entrust another person's life. And so we have to be fair. We have to be balanced. Um, and so how do we get to the human being behind all that? Particularly if it's a very famous person. I hope Kitty comes back on because she's done yeah. some super famous people. But um, yeah, how do, how do we do that? How do you get to the human being? I think Kitty is back with us. At least I'm seeing her on the screen now. Yes, I'm now oh. back. Sorry. Oh, you're back. Okay. Well, right. can we tap you for that question now that you're back? Getting to the human being behind people like Frank Sinatra or Nancy Reagan. You can choose any one of your famous subjects you think best exemplifies finding the human being behind all the glitz. Um, In the case of John F. Kennedy, when I was writing the book on Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, I tried very, very hard to get an interview with Senator George Smathers. I tried many times. I was turned down, um, but I kept calling. And finally, the secretary felt so sorry for me. She said she would try. Would I take a lunch date or after work? And I said, well, I'd come in after work because I thought it would be easier to interview then. And I went to interview Senator Smathers and he said, I only have, I only have about five, 10 minutes. So if you have one question, give it to me. And I said, yes, I do. You were with, you were with JFK in 1956 after the vice presidential at the Democratic Convention when he lost the vice presidential nomination. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And he said in his Southern way, he started talking. He said, well, he said, Jack, we were in the South of France. We were having ourselves a real good time. He said, but then Jackie got in the hospital and she miscarried. 
and Jack didn't want to go back. And I had to tell him that he had to go back. Mm -hmm. And Senator Smathers went on and on, and he was talking about Jack Kennedy in very personal terms, sexual terms, the thing that Douglas Brinkley mentioned in his last bio seminar with us that he didn't like to discuss. And I said, well, I don't quite understand, Senator. He said, well, you know, Jack was just like a rooster getting on top of a hand real fast. And I finally said, Senator, with all due respect, um, how could you know something like that? How did I know why Jack liked doing it in front of people? I was there. I saw it. <laughs> well, I couldn't believe it. I had a United States senator, former senator on the record. I published it. It was in the book. And of course, the reporter from the Washington Post wanted to make sure that I had made it up, called Senator Smathers, and I fully expected Smathers to deny it. And Senator Smathers said, well, I guess I was just run over by a dumb looking blonde. <laughs> he never denied it. And it was one of the most explosive pieces of information. Does it tell you something about the subject? Yes, it mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. They did it. Your subject did it. I mean, that was his action. That tells you more about him. Um, how about uh, a little less uh, dramatic revelations of the human being behind the famous person? Um, that's a real well, challenge. I can give you one. I remember an anecdote about Frank Sinatra being at his daughter's birthday party and uh, all the little girls were gathered around and his former wife Nancy Sinatra was hosting the party and one of the little girls broke an antique uh, something that was on the mantle and Mrs. Sinatra was just outraged and the little girl started crying and she ran away and Frank Sinatra walked over and took the other antique matching one and smashed it on the floor and said, that's all right, honey. Now let's go get some cake and ice cream. Well, it was quite dramatic, but it yeah. did show you something about Sinatra and he felt sorry for the little girl and he knew he could replace the antiques. Oh, that's lovely. May I share something uh, from my experience? Sure. Uh Absolutely. Sometimes you have you think you have the material that explains what what the psych the psychology of someone or at least what they're going through, but you really need other pieces for it to make sense. And I was fortunate in the case of the Max Steiner biography that Max's letters, uh, scores in which he made copious autobiographical notes, recording sessions, all of that survived. It had been saved by a curator. <laughs> So I would find a, an, ex, an explosive letter from him telling his agent that he was quitting the film business and he didn't care if he went into debt and didn't care about this and didn't care about that. And it was such an odd letter. And I knew that Max had, he was sort of temperamentally extreme, but he, that, that was out of character. And there are two layers that I always add on when researching a celebrity piece, whether it was for the a &E biography series on which I was a producer, mostly doing more current figures or the two books that I wrote about deceased composers. One layer is, is a fairly obvious one. It's the, it's the newspapers of the time. It's the media. What was happening on that day that we were all reading about and learning about because those impacted these people as well. In the case of, forgive me, celebrities or the people we're writing about, the other layer that was very important were the trade journals because as Variety and Hollywood Reporter carried mm -hmm. news that would be perhaps the first thing that these subjects would read before they read the New York Times or the LA Times. So I put those three layers together and I looked at the dates and saw what was going on when Max wrote this very strange letter where he was at the top of his field, the top paid composer at Warner Brothers, you know, scoring terrific films and here he is wanting to quit. And then I realized and saw that David O. Selznick had begun filming Gone with the Wind with the great fire in Atlanta sequence, and Selznick had not asked Max to score the film, even though they had had a long history of working together, and Max was obsessed at that point, three years into this book's fame. Uh, he was just obsessed with getting that job. 
uh, getting a, a loan out from Warner Brothers to score the film. And, and I also saw that he had received a, a little letter from David O. Selznick that was innocuous in and of itself, but made no reference to Gone with the Wind. So I'm sure Max was just furious about that. Well, of course, David O. Selznick did ask him to, sc to score the film, and that was one of the most stressful, nightmarish experiences of Max's <laughs> life. But that letter would not have made any sense to me if I hadn't looked at, at what else was going on. So context, I think, for all biographies, of course, but I think the trade journals and all that are, are equally essential. They, they helped me many times make sense of uh, some of, of the more extreme reactions that, that my subjects were having. Yeah, that also reinforces Kitty's uh, earlier comment about start with the chronology, because as you then can peg what's happening in the subject's life to the larger events around them, which are bound to affect them. Also, Stephen, you've done, what, over 200 documentaries about famous people, um, some of them like Robert Redford or people like that that we know, and some of them are uh, retroactive or vintage type. What is, it's a form of biography, documentary. So how would you, and you characterize how doing, a, and Alan's work with you on this, um, how that kind, that form, what challenges it poses that are different from a written biography? Yes, because even, thank you, even though my book subjects are lesser known to the general public, you're right, the people I was producing biographical profiles of for the, say, a &E biography series were Spielberg and Redford and Newman and Harrison Ford, people who pay a lot of people to keep their lives as private as possible. And they are, and I'm going to generalize a bit, but I, I'm curious to get Kitty's thoughts on this. Uh, they hire gatekeepers to keep people like biographers away, and they are used to getting their way. And I found that, uh, and I had a very supportive <laughs> boss uh, in, who said, we're doing this. We don't need their permission. They're public figures. And even though the subject might tell all of his or her uh, intimates not to cooperate, we kept going for with getting high school teachers, getting you know neighbors, getting anyone, because you can always find people to talk about someone who <laughs> is famous. And uh, in the case of one of those people you mentioned, I won't say which one, uh, we did get a call at, at, at 1159 on the, on the midnight clock saying, okay, okay, <laughs> I see you're doing this. I'm going to cooperate now. <laughs> and it, so then it was a scramble to try to incorporate as much of that access. And uh, so sometimes persistence is really key in the modern biography. And, and again, I'll be curious to see if, if Kitty has found that because you just can't take no for an answer. And I have colleagues who are in similar situations who are so discouraged when important to them people say no. And I know that uh, I had I had no's when I was writing my Bernard Herrmann book in my early 20s. Uh, his widow, who at that time had all of his scores for films like Citizen Kane and the Hitchcock films of Psycho and Vertigo or Taxi Driver, his final film. And, and she had all of his correspondence and she was living in London. And I saved up and I had one shot at, to go to London because I wasn't getting any cooperation from her. I wasn't hearing anything. And I went, I, I realized she worked at the BBC as a producer and I sat in the lobby and just politely said I was there and I'd love to speak with her. <laughs> and she came out and couldn't have been nicer and said, I'm so, so sorry, I'd be happy to cooperate. But I, I think it showed her just how personal this was and how seriously I was taking it. And I saw her weeks ago and, and she's like a second mother to me now. Uh, <laughs> So we really built a strong connection, but it took many months and, and accumulating interviews with, with people like Aaron Copeland and others who were you know, significant. And I think the more people you can amass like that, that have a reputation that, the, <coughs> that others might say, I, well, I wouldn't be wasting my time. But again, Kitty, I'd love, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, listen, I applaud you 100%. Most important thing, I think, beyond intelligence is persistence. And I think you have to love your subject. And I have, I don't mean loved every one of my subjects, but I had deep admiration and respect for them and what they did and what they accomplished. I believed in their life. I believed that their lives had influenced our own lives in the 20th century, either historically, literally, musically, politically in some way I believed and that kept me going but I agree with you you must be persistent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's hard it's really hard it's especially hard if you get rejected I remember I was terrified uh, I wanted a, an interview with Brad Dexter 
and he had turned me down several times and I wanted an interview with this man because he had saved Frank Sinatra's life. And <clears throat> I called him and wrote to him and the answer was always no, no. And I too did what Stephen did and happened to be in Palm Springs <laughs> um, with a friend. And this is another thing, make sure not just write a thank you note, but sometimes have someone with you. When I went to interview Oprah Winfrey's father, I had a young guy with me who was driving me around because I didn't know Memphis very well, didn't know any place. And he was so intrigued that he turned on his telephone recorder and recorded our entire interview. I had done that as well but I didn't take a picture. So when it came time for the lawyers to come to Washington to vet my manuscript, I had a woman who had already vetted me once before, but she brought a young male attorney and he said, I'd like to see your, <clears throat> I'd like to see your notes and I'd like to see the transcript of that tape. He said, fine. And I was starting to go up the stairs and I heard her turn around to him and said, she said, She's probably got a picture of herself with him as well. And I said, Kathy, I heard you say that. And I do have a picture of myself. And she said, Kitty, if you have a picture of yourself with Oprah Winfrey's father, we need to see it right now. And I brought it down and she said, we've got to use this. And I said, no, under no circumstances, we're not using that picture. No, she, I said, you've got my tapes. You've got my notes. I had a witness. What else do you need? She said, people aren't going to believe that Oprah Winfrey's father has told you what he has told you about Oprah, about having a baby when she was 16 years old. People aren't going to believe that. I said, I, I don't understand. She said, you've got to show the picture of yourself. And she said, why are you objecting? And the reason I was objecting, if you could see the picture, I'm leaning over and he's whispering in my ear, my hair's matted, the blazer is too tight across. I mean, it was sheer vanity. I look <laughs> terrible. <laughs> and she said, Kitty, get over it, get over it because otherwise there'll be a lawsuit. And I said, and if there's a lawsuit, we'll win. She said, lawsuits cost money. Mm. <clears throat> anyway, long story telling uh, you. That's uh that's interesting. You brought up uh, Kitty Brad Dexter over 20 years ago. Uh, I was doing the screening out here in Palm Springs and he came, he came and I was introduced to him and his uh, response to my introducing myself was, how come you're not showing the asphalt jungle? <laughs> and he <laughs> glared at me with his baby blues. <laughs> I, I, felt like, I felt like Louis Calhoun in the asphalt jungle. <laughs> I had a wonderful interview with Brad Dexter, but I had to work very, very hard to get it. Yeah, he yeah. came to the interview with his wife. Both of them had tape recorders. I had a tape recorder. We looked like we were <laughs> setting up for RCA. And we sat down <laughs> and I said, I really need to ask you, you're the man who saved Frank Sinatra's life. Uh, tell me what happened. You were friends before, your enemies after. It was a fascinating interview. Again, mm -hmm. though, it goes to what Stephen said, persistence, yeah. persistence. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's hard. It's difficult to have someone say no to you 10 times. Yep, it's true. But when they say yes on the 11th time, <laughs> yes. I think I'm going to switch over to the chat room. There have been some, some things coming in. Um, the last question, and I'll speak on this myself. Um, what, how do you, how do you treat the years that your, your famous person is no longer in the limelight? What is their life like? And this is when the Hollywood Reporter and Variety and all that are not, if, if they're Hollywood or People Magazine are not following them anymore. Um, and I found, particularly with Burt Lancaster, that that was, I was sort of scared of that part of the book. And yet it turned out to be the most meaningful of all. Um, that's when a person's humanity comes through, how they face the last years of their life. Um, and we often forget all about that. So I'll leave on that note, but let me get over here to chat. Where's chat? 
Oh, more, right. I'm using a different um, computer here, laptop. Okay, let's see. Susan Page, this is a pretty basic question. When you are working on a biography and want to interview famous people in the entertainment world, let's not call them celebrities, she says, how do you get good contact information for them? Once you have done that, can you suggest the best way to persuade them to cooperate with you? Good question. I think um, for me, I started out with the Screen Actors Guild and tried to get the name of the agent um, and then getting through to the agent and then you get through to the manager and then you get through to the assistant and then you, you know, it's persistence again. You know, it's, it's a hierarchy. You're going up, up, up. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Other thoughts? Sometimes, sometimes if you get put off by the gatekeepers, if you can call the, I, I've had where I've gotten people directly and they've picked up the phone. And uh, uh, I had one person tell me, well, you know, you need to talk to my publicity person and this and that. And then I started talking to him, talking to him and then saying, well, OK, <laughs> why don't we schedule something? And uh, I did that with Gene Simmons mm. uh, uh, when I wrote my first book on the actor, Charlie McGraw. And then she called me back and she said, there's a couple things I don't want to talk about. I don't want to talk about my marriage to Stuart Granger. I don't want to talk about Howard Hughes. And I don't want to talk about Otto Preminger. And I said, fine. I wanted to talk to her about Spartacus and, and in cold blood and everything. And of course, we were on the phone for two and a half hours talking mainly about Otto Preminger, <laughs> Howard Hughes, <laughs> and everything she didn't want to talk about. So, you know, there you go. In my experience, there's often someone who is close to the subject, but not <laughs> famous, uh, a helper, an assistant, a former assistant, a stand-in, if it's an actor, someone that was a confidant. And if I can find that person, I, I had many good conversations with saying, listen, here's how you get to this person, or here's what this person is afraid of. And if you can convey mm -hmm. that you're not going to go into this area. And uh, similar to, I suspect, uh, experiences, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, Kitty, and Kate and Alan, but often when people say, I don't want to talk about Howard Hughes or something, and you'll say, fine, tell me about third grade or something, and Howard Hughes will inevitably come up after 20 minutes. Exactly. Once exactly. the person feels that you have agreed to not be too intrusive with them, and that sometimes it's the second or third meeting or conversation, the guard goes down, the trust is built. And I, I always found if, if I could meet that person, that friend, that associate in, in person somewhere and introduce myself, and it's, it's that special quality of looking someone in, and they make a decision of whether you seem a trustworthy person to have a conversation with. Exactly. Even, you know, I remember when I was doing the Frank Sinatra book, <clears throat> I, f I found a woman who uh, had known Frank Sinatra in Hoboken. And the only reason I was trying to find this woman was because Frank Sinatra was trying to get a gaming license in Las Vegas. And part of that was to swear under oath that you had never been arrested. Because if you'd been arrested, you'd be denied the gaming license. Mm -hmm. And when I was in Hoboken doing research on Sinatra, I was told that Sinatra had done time in jail. He was arrested and thrown into jail for three days. And that was back in 1939 when there was such a thing as a morals charge. And a woman had him arrested because he had backed out of marrying her. And her brothers were policemen and she had him thrown in jail. And I finally found this woman in a little town called Lodi, New Jersey. I had her name, I had her address, I had her phone number, and I suddenly got scared. I really needed this woman as a source. I didn't know what to do. I thought if I wrote her a letter, she wouldn't respond. If I called her up, she'd hang up on, I really didn't know what to do. And I went to a friend of mine, a journalism professor in Chicago. And he said, oh, for God's sakes, Kitty, go to, you go to her house. Mm -hmm. I said, you go to her house? He said, yeah, you knock on the door, you say, I want to talk to you, and you go in. I said, no, I'm a member of the Junior League. And that's what I sounded like. I said, I couldn't do it. Well, 
I went to a friend of mine and he said, come on, I'll drive you to Lodi, New Jersey. Drove me to Lodi. We got to the house. I sat in that car for an hour. I was so scared. What I was scared of was that she'd turn me down. I was afraid of the rejection. I got to the door and this nice woman, gray hair, answered the door. And I said, Mrs. Caravanas, I'm so sorry. I didn't, bah, 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 bah. And, the, and the sentences ran into each other and I didn't make any sense. She said, honey, you're so nervous. Why don't you come in, have a cup of tea and sit down and tell me what's wrong? I said, well, nothing's wrong. I just wanted to talk to you. I'm doing this book. I'm, good. I'm doing this book on Frank Sinatra. And she said, oh, I remember Frankie. And for the next three hours, she told me about Frank Sinatra. She told me about the morals chart. She told me why he had been thrown in jail. And I came out three hours later and my, my, I was full of myself then. You couldn't even talk to me. I mean, I just thought I was gonna get a Pulitzer Prize or something carrying on. But it taught me a lesson. It really taught me a lesson. I, it wasn't the first or last time I was scared in doing it. But you have to almost push through your fear mm -hmm. and make a, I, I felt I made a fool of myself. This woman and I, I stayed in touch with her like you did, Alan, with people you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I stayed in touch with her. And when the Frank Sinatra book came out, I got a letter from a great niece of hers. And she said, I'm sorry to tell you that our great aunt died before publication. And she said, our family, many members in our family have been very upset with your book. She said, but the younger generation, those of us who knew great aunt Grace, we're very happy she talked to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I took that as, um, uh, of all the things I went through to write that book, it was it was a wonderful letter to receive. Sorry wow. for taking time. That's a wonderful. I th that's Great. wonderful, and I think um, to pick up on Susan's and what you just said, and also the second part of Susan's question. Um, I found that if you start with someone who's famous, you start with the people you know will talk to you, and you get this sort of first layer. And then they, you jump up to the next layer and then you say, well, I've spoken to so-and-so. Oh, all right, I'll talk to you. And you work your way up, 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 up until, I remember the day that I got James Earl Jones for, you know, talking about, yes, I'm in, I'm in, you know, because then you get James Earl Jones and then a whole bunch of other people will talk to you. So it's strategic too. Um, mm -hmm. The best way to persuade people, to, reading from Susan's question, to cooperate with you is that everyone likes to feel reassured that someone else has already talked. That's right. Yeah. And you have it's called name dropping at your very best. At your yes. yes. And, uh, and each level, each level, someone opens a door where you're yes. able to go through that door to the next level and to the next level and to the sure. next and this, level. And this is a good scheme for any mm -hmm. famous person, movies or yeah. otherwise. It's the yeah. same thing. Let me see what else is here because we're gonna have to wrap up here in a minute. Uh, right. From Jacqueline Jones, Ms. Kelly, thank you so much for the excellent tip about writing lengthy chronology. Mm -hmm. um, Sela Star, great practical information about chronology and interviews and about thank you notes. Earning your subjects trust is fundamental. Um, do you try to build trust with the gatekeeper? So yes, I think we spoke about that. Um, and also tips from the gatekeepers trying to keep the author from getting an interview well, perseverance, persistence, and maybe coming in from another angle. Um, Stephanie von Steland, uh, especially when writing about a well-known subject, there are certain stories which become part of a legend, but over time it is no longer possible to ascertain whether these stories are true or made up. How do you deal with those stories? Well, I think Stephen and Alan both spoke to that, is that you, you get the truth and, and the Kirk Douglas story, you, you get what really happened and those myths get busted, um, even though people cling to them anyway. Um, yeah, I, uh, sometimes you have to put in both stories. Yeah. In writing about Frank Sinatra, right. I had one story from Lana Turner and another story from Ava Gardner. Right. I put them both in. 
Yeah, you, you put them in and you let the reader sometimes draw the conclusion and you offer your own context on it. And, uh, and the thing about exploding the myth that Kate just say, if I may, there's been a myth for years that Michael Curtiz, when he directed the film uh, um, The Charge of the Light Brigade in 1936, killed hundreds of horses and they filmed down in Mexico. And David Niven wrote about all of this in his book, uh, Bring on the Empty Horses, which was a quote taken from Michael Curtiz, an order given, bring on the empty horses. And uh, in going through all the legal files and everything, this is a complete myth. And I wrote about it at length on how the movie was really made, what really happened and so forth. And yet I can turn on the TV and somebody will be repeating the same story again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And I even took an extract of my book and published it in a magazine about Charge of the Light Brigade that I didn't get paid for because I just get so annoyed at hearing this fairy tale and it's become hardened into like permanent truth, even though it's not true. So yeah. like you know, it's an ongoing battle with the myth making. Um, Peter Benjaminson asks if any of us have actually been sued by our subjects. Happily Hello. <laughs> Hello. No. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Kitty can speak was, that. <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. I was yes. sued by Frank Sinatra before I had written a word. Before <laughs> I had written a word. And I went to my publisher and my publisher said sorry we don't have a manuscript your legal insurance doesn't cover us so the publisher wouldn't stand behind me and i went to the writers groups that i belong to and particularly washington independent writers this is back in the 1980s and they said wait a minute kitty let's get this straight you've just been sued by frank sinatra and you're asking us to support you on the basis of the first amendment i said yes you haven't written a word i said no and we don't you want to pay your own legal fees i said yes i just need your support we're in <laughs> We're in, they said. They went off to the American Society of Journalists and Authors. What? She, she's going to pay? First Amendment. We're in. I was supported by these wonderful writers groups. I said, yes, I'll pay my own legal fees. But this is a principle. He has a right to sue me after I've written something, but I haven't written anything. He kept this lawsuit going for one year. It cost me one hundred thousand dollars and wow. finally his lawyers came and said <clears throat> uh if miss kelly will drop the lawsuit we'll drop the lawsuit and by that time i was like excuse me you should say you're sorry i'm not gonna say i'm sorry so because i knew the headline would be sinatra wins kelly loses and i owed it to those writers groups to stand up Yes, I have been sued. And that lawsuit went on for quite some time. And finally, um, <laughs> Sinatra dropped it and the book came out and we all lived happily ever after. <laughs> well, we afraid we have to wrap up. There are a couple of quick little points in this uh, chat room. Um, Beverly Gray, whom we all know, uh, mentions that SAG no longer gives contact info, which is I use for, for Lancaster, certainly for publicists, for its members, and the Academy Museum has been closed since the start of the pandemic. But um, Heidi Feldman suggests to try to find publicists, agents, and managers, this is an access question, for artists in the film industry, try a one month membership in IMDB Pro. So those are some tips. Oh, I see somebody. That is, that is that is absolutely correct, and I have a membership on IMDb Pro, and it in many cases it does work. That is okay. They're, they're usually about one agent or manager behind the accurate representation. Yeah. They'll send you to the right people usually when you call yeah. me up. I think we have to wrap it up. It's been a full hour. Thank you all the panelists and all the attendees. I hope we've all learned something. I certainly did. Um, and thank you for the excellent comments uh, that came in uh, on the chat box. And thank you to Michael Gately for making this all possible. Oh, Michael. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> thank you, and thank you, Kate. <laughs>
our revered executive director. Yes, thank you very much. Oh, you, you could go on if you're if, oh. in, in that vein. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we three could go on. I mean, four. For, oh, yeah. and thanks, everyone. So the Plutarch Award announcement is now posted and hope to see many of you at the social hour in a half hour from now. Okay. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, Michael. Okay, next year. Thank you, Michael. Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>